Thank you for coming here. You guys are brave. You're in an alternative form of medicine that really isn't accepted by the uh, conventional guys. And you're here on a Saturday afternoon at 2.30 listening to mitochondria. That's gutsy. Uh, I've been a clinician for 35 years, so while I'm starting to get a little bit into research, what you're going to hear about today is stuff that's practical. I don't much care about things that don't actually work in my office and my clinic to help my patients. Uh, and so you're going to get some hardcore stuff that you can actually use in your practice. Uh, the disclaimer is that I invented uh, the mitochondrial functional analysis that you're going to be hearing about in a little bit, and I am one of the owners of the company that owns it. Okay, biggest problem in anti-aging medicine has to do with diagnosis, not therapy. You know, stop and think about it, though. The thing that really drives change in medicine is not new and approved therapies. It's being able to diagnose it. I liken it to high blood pressure. You can't treat high blood pressure, never could, until somebody invented a blood pressure cuff. Then everything comes secondary to that. So if you think the mitochondria are important, if you want to upregulate your mitochondria and get them to behave better, you really need to be able to measure them. As my good buddy Ward Dean says, aging is the one disease that everybody gets. But it's also the one disease that has no diagnostic criteria. And that's the biggest problem uh, with anti-aging medicine today is that we don't have any kind of standard way to measure either health or aging. And if you stop and think about it, what we got on one side is you have health, whatever that is, some kind of optimal condition. And over here we have degeneration associated with aging. And you don't just pop from here to here. There's a transition, and you're moving along that transition. Our whole diagnostic system is around here to tell you if you're here yet, but not to tell you if you're here or if you aren't there, how far away you are from there and how close you are to there. And what I propose to you today is that that can be done by studying the dynamics of your mitochondria. So in, in essence, you are as healthy as your mitochondria are. If your mitochondria are functioning along the levels of a 24-year-old, you're as healthy as a 24-year-old. So my definition of aging is this. Aging is the gradual transition away from youthful health. There are many factors causing this transition, but the most central and the most inclusive factor is mitochondrial function. Thus, youthful health can be best characterized by optimal mitochondrial function, and aging can best be characterized by the degree to which a subject is moving away from youthful mitochondrial function. And well, that, there it is. That's one of the mitochondria, and you'll be happy to know I'm not really going to discuss that much at all. There's all kinds of interesting things in there we could talk about for hours. If you are interested in a free webinar on this subject that goes into depth for about an hour and a half, we actually get into all this stuff, uh, just uh, email me at my email address, which is drdoctor at antiagingmedicine.com. And uh, we'll sign you up for a, a webinar on this. We'll get into detail. But basically, this is what it's all about. Do you guys realize that the difference, the functional difference between the cell from a 70-year-old man and from a 24-year-old man is one thing? You know how many things go on in cells? We could list them on for quite a while. A lot of cellular activities. But essentially, the only difference between those cellular activities of a young man and those of an older man is one. It's what goes on in the mitochondria. Basically, all the other cellular activities, SNPs and, met, um, and polymorphisms notwithstanding, are essentially the same. So if you want your cells to behave as youth, more youthful cells, the idea is very easy. Get your mitochondria up and running in a youthful direction. So I'm going to cover a few basics here for you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about mitochondria. I find that, you know, we all study this in school, but uh, if you're like me, you, didn't, you don't know much about mitochondria until you kind of maybe after school started to learn about it because you became curious. So let's just look at the basics. Well, what happens to mitochondria? Well, actually, a lot of things. I'm just going to focus on energy production. But there are other things such as apoptosis and such like that that are controlled by mitochondria as well. 
Oxygen gets converted to water plus energy. Oxygen is one of the highest energy molecules in the universe. Water is the lowest. High energy, low energy, what happens? Energy gets released. As this energy gets released, free radicals are formed. It's a natural part of the process. And these free radicals damage the mitochondria. It has to happen. It's just part of the way it goes. The longer you're alive, the more damage your mitochondria are going to accumulate, the more hits they're going to take. That's why you can't live forever. The less efficient your mitochondria are, and this is key, the less efficient your mitochondria are, the more this damage is going to occur. So if you want your mitochondria to go down the tubes fast, make them less efficient. If you want them to go down the tubes very slowly, make them more efficient. This accumulated free radical damage leads to mitochondrial decay. So mitochondrial inefficiency precedes mitochondrial decay. That's an important differentiation we'll talk about. Mitochondrial decay is the central lesion in the aging process and in all degenerative disease. Aging and degenerative disease is determined by your starting point. That's your genetics. You know, you get your mitochondria from your mom, and so that's kind of where you start from. That's the hand of cards you were given uh, when you came into this world. So your, your risk for aging and degenerative disease is determined by how good those mitochondria are you got and how fast you're going to destroy them. Mitochondrial decay is inevitable. Ultimately, we all die. What is not inevitable is the incredibly fast rate of decay that we see in our societies today and what this conference is all about in one, in one sense is what can be done to slow down the rate of mitochondrial decay. The rate of mitochondrial decay, if I've interested you enough, is determined by one thing, and that is mitochondrial efficiency. So that's the basics. So I've used this term mitochondrial efficiency a few times. What am I talking about? I'm talking about something that's measurable, folks. I'm talking about like a CBC or a SED rate, something you can actually do on your patient and see how efficient they are. And it's standardized, and you get an actual quantitative number, not like more efficient or less efficient, like a number. Uh, basically, we're talking about three intrinsic components. How much mitochondrial ATP production, now notice I'm not talking about ATP production that comes from glycolysis, I'm talking strictly mitochondrial ATP production. Uh, can that patient do at rest in one situation? Now when they're at rest, we're looking mostly at the ATP that's produced by the brain, heart, liver, and kidney, or under an exertional level. That's looking primarily at the ATP produced in muscles. Uh, maximal mitochondrial ATP production from fatty acids. So not only is it important to know, as you'll see in a little bit, how much ATP you're making, in actuality it's even more important to know what percentage of that ATP you're making from glucose versus what percentage you're making from fatty acids. Because health and youthful mitochondrial function are characterized by ATP that's produced primarily from fatty acids and not so much from glucose as you become less healthy and move to, on the continuum towards disease, you're going to produce more and more of your ATP from glucose and progressively less from fatty acids. And lastly, how efficient your mitochondria works can be determined by measuring the amount of ATP production that is increased as you increase the inspired oxygen content. So right now we're breathing 21 percent room air. Well, our AT, uh, we'll put out so much ATP as a result of that. What would happen if we increase that up to 31 percent inspired oxygen? That would be 50 percent more oxygen, right? An efficient mitochondria will produce exactly 50 percent more ATP as a result of that. But inefficient mitochondria won't. So basically, we're going to go through a testing process where we're going to measure your ATP production under room air conditions, and then we're going to challenge you with oxygen and see what you can do with it.